Hello, we are backstage at Ignite London, an event held by Hay House Publishers that brings back the brings to you the freshest voices in self-help and spirituality and well-being. And we are really honoured to be sat here with Dr. Robert Holden, who is the director of the Happiness Project and Success Intelligence. Uh, Robert's work has been featured on Oprah, on Good Morning America, and in two major BBC TV documentaries, The Happiness Formula, Formula and How to Be Happy. Robert is also the best-selling author of the books Happiness Now, Shift Happens, Authentic Success, Be Happy and Lovability. So, Dr. Robert, welcome. How Thank are you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, I've just given a talk and it's nice to go first, actually. Yeah. Often at um, Hay House events, I get to do the last talk. So I'm like, you know, as you're building and you're building and you're building. And uh, it's great to do the last talk, too, because that's when we're going out into our lives. Mm. But also I love giving the first talk because you set the whole thing up. So, mm. And it was yeah. a very good setup. Yeah. Thank you very much. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Robert, our first question to you is... Um, for Addictive Daughter, our kind of philosophy is um, really working on life's issues from the inside out. And um, we wondered, how does that resonate with you, the kind of doing the inner work? And what are three tips that you could give to kind of really work on your insides? Okay. Well, firstly, I think it has to happen from the inside out. Mm -hmm. So there's no better place to do it from. You know, I think most of us feel... Uh, that the answers are outside of us and so we go searching and that's not a bad thing because that's when we find certain books and uh, courses and teachers and people who inspire us but hopefully those people those books those courses are actually telling us to go inside us mm -hmm. so it's a good thing you know to look outside yourself but ultimately the true things I think are going to tell you to go back inside so in my work what I've discovered is that the, nothing beats self-knowledge. Nothing mm. beats getting to know yourself. And I think a lot of us, we put that off. We say, I'll get to know myself when I'm happier. I'll get mm. to know myself when I feel more successful. Mm -hmm. But really what we have to do is to be able to stop and pay attention to ourselves and actually just ask ourselves questions like, when do I most feel like me? Mm. When do I really feel like I'm being true to myself? When am I at my happiest? When do I feel most alive? When do I feel like life is meaningful? And, and there's our clues, because the answer to those big questions, questions that hopefully we can do with our friends, by the way, mm. um, those, those answers are like the, um, the signs on the road, which are saying, follow this, because this will help you to stay on track. So. Mm. Really, I wouldn't suggest any techniques to begin with. I would actually just say, pay attention to yourself and ask yourself some good questions. In fact, find one good question. Mm -hmm. And it could simply be, when do I feel most alive? Mm -hmm. Or, when am I at my happiest? And stay with that question and dig deep with that question because the digger you deep, the more uh, you'll find more gold there, mm -hmm. if you like. So just go for that and that will help you in particular do one really important thing. It'll help you to tap that inner wisdom that's going to serve you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So the more you pay attention to yourself, ask a good question, then you'll find that inner wisdom and it will take you. Mm, thank you. Amazing. Mm. Um, so your idea of lovability explores the science and the art of love, mm. essentially. And yeah. so we're really interested because we, we love looking at love oh, and yeah. relationships mm. and stuff like that. Um, and so we really just wondered, firstly, what in your background, like, what drew, kind of drew you to that subject? And, you know, is there any little tips that we can do to help us with self-love and practice that idea? Yeah. Well, look, it's... It's the subject of our lives, isn't it? Mm. I mean, when are we not really thinking about love? You know, even when we're being cool, we're still really thinking about love. It's such a big thing, you know, to, to love ourselves, to find someone we love, to live a life we love. It's completely, it's completely there. Mm. I got involved really in all of this work because of really what was happening in my own family. I had, um, my mother was, de was experiencing depression and had experienced depression most of her life. So I was watching somebody who I love very much, finding it very difficult to love herself and be in the world. My father was alcoholic. Um, he lived homeless for the last 10 years of his life. Um, you can imagine, you know, for, for, a, for a boy, that was really painful and difficult. So I'm watching like the two most important people in my life going through so much pain. And it raised so many questions for me. And none of the questions were being answered at school. You know, at school it was still algebra, the spinning jenny, 
1066. But what I wanted to know about was was life. You know, mm. how do we live life? So that's what got me started. And then, you know, then I went and studied psychology and philosophy and I met my friends and I created the Happiness Project back in 1992, Success Intelligence that you've mentioned. Both of these projects, actually the heart of both of them is love. That's mm -hmm. what I discovered. Mm -hmm. So it would be about eight years ago I created Lovability, which was really an attempt to create the class I didn't have at school. Okay, I actually thought, wouldn't it have been great to have had a class on love at school? Mm -hmm. We didn't have one. Mm -hmm. You know, the closest we got to at school was Romeo and Juliet. The love story where two people kill themselves. How good is that? I mean, you know, not much of a love story, it, you know, in terms of happy endings. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I studied psychology, we had one lecture on love. Um, it was called Interpersonal Attraction Theory. It was so dry. It was terrible. It was the worst thing. So anyway, there I am, you know, having my own quarter life crisis, if you like, and thinking, you know, truly, 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 what's important? And I guess one of the questions that became really big for me was, was what, what is love? Mm -hmm. Truly, it seems to be the most meaningful thing in my life. Well, what is it really? So that's where I, I began. And in terms of like a tip around love, I mean, I guess it does start ultimately with a question like, this is one of my favorites. See, I found that, that a lot of the pain I was in was coming from my self-judgments. Mm. And I decided one day to ask myself a question. So I'm gonna give you another question. Mm -hmm. And the question was, what's it like to be me when I'm not judging myself? Okay, mm -hmm. that was the question. What's it like to be me when I'm not judging myself? And I realized that life isn't judging me. When I really let myself know what it's like to be me when I'm not judging myself, I realized life's not judging me. Actually, hardly anybody's judging me. You know, nothing's judging me except me. I'm the one holding myself back. I'm the one giving myself a hard time. Here's me thinking everybody wants me to live a certain way and be a certain way, and you know, they're not thinking about me. They literally are busy. They are too busy to think <laughs> about me. So actually, here's my ticket to freedom. It's like they're busy and they're not judging me. I'm only judging me. What would it be like to be me when I'm not judging myself? And all of a sudden, it was just like I found like, access to my own heart, I guess. And I thought, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to live. I'm going to give it a go. And it gave me the courage to do it. Yeah. Amazing. Brilliant answer. So. You spoke a little about a bit in, about your forgiveness in your talk, particularly yeah. forgiving yourself. Mm. Um, I think as 20-somethings, a big thing that a lot of um, our age group can struggle with is sort of the heartbreak of this decade and broken relationships and mm. actually carrying that baggage. Mm. So if you had kind of one piece of wisdom that you could express about how do you let go of what's gone before and actually move forward free of all of that, what would it be? Yeah. Well, let's begin by saying that, you know, forgiveness is um, tricky because the first time we ever really think about forgiveness is usually after something unforgivable mm -hmm. has happened. So, you know, we're starting usually in the deep end. It's not like we start with small things, you know, with forgiveness. It's like something big has happened. It's ruined our life and there's no future. And at that moment, we're going to start thinking about forgiveness. So, you know, this is a brave thing to do. But the key to forgiveness is to understand that forgiveness is a decision to have a loving relationship with yourself. So this has got nothing to do with anybody else, actually. Mm -hmm. This is to do with you and the thoughts in your mind. And what we do with forgiveness is we say, I would like to have a loving relationship with myself. My past might not have been as great as I would like it to be, but that doesn't mean that my future has to be that way too. Mm -hmm. So when we are willing to forgive, what we're really doing is we're creating a new future. And the gift is entirely for us. One of the biggest things I had to do in my 20s, late 20s actually, was I had to give up self-improvement. Self-improvement had been doing me in. I had been practicing self-improvement for like 10 years mm -hmm. and it was tragic. I just felt that this self-improvement was actually just leaving me with even more to improve. And one day, it was actually my 30th birthday when it got to the worst moment ever. 30th birthday, I should have been enjoying myself, and I was. And then round about four o'clock in the afternoon, suddenly the self-judgment started to come in. I hadn't done enough with my life. I wasn't successful enough. I wasn't this enough. I wasn't that enough. 
And I, it was, what I was doing to myself was really not good. And I realized as I was, you know, there on my knees that I'd really been practicing self-improvement for 12 years at that point. And I realized that no amount of self-improvement can make up for any lack of self-acceptance. Mm. The one thing I had never tried to do was just accept myself. Mm. I was going to accept myself after I'd improved myself, but now that I was on the improvement <laughs> track, I was 12 <laughs> years into it and like feeling like there's still so much more to go. And mm. I was just thinking, I wouldn't want this work to be that hard for me and I wouldn't want this work to be that this hard for anyone else I love. So I must be doing something to myself that's not right. Mm. And what I realized was that really I had been trying to improve myself before I'd really got a chance to know myself. And self-acceptance is, I always say self-acceptance is so good, everybody should try it at least once in their life just to see what it's like. <laughs> but it's really good because when you accept yourself, what you're really doing is you are saying, I'm going to be on my side from now on. And just because I can't quite find at the moment that magic in me, that self-worth in me, that love in me, it's not because it's not there, it's just because I haven't been looking. Mm. And if I started to look, you know, maybe I actually would find it. And if I was to accept the possibility that the happiness I'm looking for in the world is actually one of my gifts, if the, the success I want in the world is one of my gifts, the love I'm looking for, I'm made of this stuff, I'm actually made of love. If I was to accept that, then when success, happiness and love show up in the world for me, instead of being intimidated by it, worried that it won't last, I can actually enjoy it because it's like I'm going, hold on a minute, I can accept that because, you know, that's me, that's all right. So, so shifting from self-improvement to self-acceptance was really was one of the biggest shifts in my life. I, I wrote about that in a book called Shift Happens mm -hmm. and it really was the turning point for everything. You know, it just makes life so much easier. It I'm really gentler. does. It completely yeah. does. The problem with self-improvement is sounds so good, but, but mostly we're doing it from a place of I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. And what I learned was that your starting point is always where you finish at. So if you start with I'm not enough, it doesn't matter what you do, it will feel like it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. But what if, I call it the myth of inadequacy, the idea that I'm not enough. Is it that we're really not enough or is it that we just haven't got to know ourselves enough? Mm -hmm. And my experience is it's about that, that mm. we have to get to know ourselves enough. Mm. Every true teaching says, be yourself and be more of yourself. Mm. And most of us, what we say is, that's great for everyone else, but not for me. Mm. And what we have to do is override that thought and say, no, this belongs to everybody, including me. And so, you know, today I always say that if you think something's missing in your life, it's probably you. Mm. Be more of you. Dare to do it. I know it's tricky, but the dare will help you to experience more happiness, more love, more success mm. if you go for it. Mm. And that actually leads really nicely onto the next question, which your the title of your talk here at at, Unite, uh, at Ignite um, was "Ignite Your Life." Yeah. So, what in a nutshell, what does that mean to you? Well, I think ultimately it it means just maybe it's the summary of what we've been talking about you know that you pay attention to yourself and you try not to get too distracted that's the big mm. thing i think we're so manic we're so busy mm. you know it's um I, I wrote a book called authentic success and i began the book by talking about the monty python sketch the hundred yards dash for people with a poor sense of direction mm -hmm. that sketch for me sums up london mm -hmm. sums up life today you know we're all running really really fast and then you say, where are you running to? And we haven't a clue. Mm -hmm. We haven't a clue. It's just that everyone's running, so yeah. we better run too, you know. <laughs> yeah. And in a sense, I think what we have to do is just to say, let's not be distracted by that today. Let's stop running. Let's pay attention to ourselves. Let's find that wise voice inside and then follow it. And I think if you follow it, that's when you experience mm -hmm. that feeling of being ignited. Mm -hmm. It looks really inspiring to everybody mm -hmm. else. Um, if you think, for instance, just of your favorite artists, your favorite singers, your favorite actors, it's like they dig down inside themselves. They bring up, out something that's so authentic and unique even, and yet we can all relate to it. Mm -hmm. It's like almost the more personal they get, the more we can all relate to mm -hmm. it. And I think that's what we have to do in our lives. We have to sort of say, I'm going to be really personal with myself. I'm going to find out the real core of what I'm about, and I'm going to just 
I'm going to trust that actually the world's ready to hear about that. My mm -hmm. friends are ready to hear about it, the family are ready to hear about it. And it may rock the boat a little bit to begin with, but it's better, it's like it's a risk worth taking mm -hmm. to be yourself. You know, if you, if you don't do it, it's more of a risk not to be yourself than it is to be yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. You've yeah. got to take the risk. You've got no choice. But I think when you take that risk, amazingly, you find that your friends and your family they and your people at work, they take note. Mm -hmm. They may not say something immediately, but they'll be taking note and they'll be going, I like what they're doing. I like I, they're doing something. And then you start to get into those little conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually remember when my brother left um, his work when he was about 25 to come and help me set up my business. He hadn't talked about uh, spirituality or psychology to anybody at work. All of a sudden, as soon as he said he was leaving to set up my business for me, he was having lunch dates one-on-one -on -one with all of his colleagues. And they were all just like saying things like, by the way, I read Louise Hay. <laughs> you know, by the way, I do Tai Chi. You know, by the way, I drink herbal tea. <laughs> not, you know, not at work, obviously, but you know, secretly at home. And all of a sudden, it was just like coming out that this is what we all do, but sometimes we're just not courageous enough to show it. And so, anyway, I think just like back yourself to be to take the risk and to know that if you take the risk, there will be somebody else, more hopefully than one person, but somebody else to begin with who will say, "I know what you're doing. I'm cheering you on." And that's how we do it. Mm, fantastic. Mm. Robert, thank you so much for coming in and chatting with us today. Thank you. Um, we just said when we heard your speech, you've, you've got such a calming energy. Mm. And at the end of your talk, when you left, we both went, oh. Yes, yeah, it's <laughs> so, so funny as and well. now. We, 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 you're so calm, and, but also we were wetting ourselves the whole yeah. time. I love that. I really do. Because <laughs> this work is, I always try to, I think, you know, this work should end up with us enjoying ourselves more, totally. don't you think? Yeah. Totally. And I, I tell you, I've been so serious at times in my life with <laughs> all this work. And, you know, you're thinking, come on, no, this should be ending up with something yeah. being a yeah. bit, bit happier and along the way too as well. Definitely. I agree. So thank you for saying that. Thank That's you. very cool. Where can we find out more about your work? So website, social media, anything that you've yeah. got? coming up? Well, I, I love my Facebook page. Mm -hmm. So that is DR Robert Holden. Robert Holden had gone, so I had to put the DR in mm -hmm. there, which is such a shame. But anyway, DR Robert Holden. Mm -hmm. I really am on there every day. I love to love just to post and share things mm -hmm. there. Robertholden.org as well is um, is, is the website. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm just I'm I just want to say I'm passionate about what you're doing because you know for a lot of us we are experiencing our midlife crises earlier than ever before mm -hmm. and one of the reasons for that I believe is because more than before we know there's a better way mm -hmm. we all know there's a better way than the way we're doing it mm -hmm. and I think we're becoming aware of that earlier and earlier in our lives so we have this early maturity if you like mm -hmm. which says there's a better way than this but then that maturity needs support if it is going to mature if that makes sense mm -hmm. so you know what you're doing is so spot on because you're helping people who i think will it'll mean that we won't need a midlife crisis later yeah. on mm -hmm. because in a way we're dealing with it now oh, and getting wood. ready for a good yeah. life yeah. Yeah. so yeah that's what we good believe on you. <laughs> no really good on you that's thank terrific you. Thank, thank you so much for chatting with us and thank you so much for watching